I'm looking here at the uh, website, rare.us. Red in the center, as in, you know, yeah, okay, <laughs> I get it. Chuck Hagel bombs a congressional Bergdahl meeting. So who is Dave Bratt? And Eric Cantor goes down. Fascinating stuff. Let's ask Jack, Jack Hunter, who's the editor over at Rare U.S., former talk show host, co-author of The Tea Party Comes to Washington. Uh, his thoughts on this. Hey, Jack, welcome to the program. Good to be with you, Tom. Thank you. Um, I'm hearing a bunch of different narratives uh, one is the one that I originally presented, which is that uh, Dave Bratt uh, is teaching college because uh, a guy by the name of John Allison, who is the, per- the CEO of BT&T Bank, uh, which got a $3.1 billion bailout from George Bush and had a charitable foundation. That charitable foundation gave a half million dollars to the university to hire Dave Bratt to teach Ayn Rand, specifically Ayn Rand. Um, so he's kind of a product of that. That uh, Mr. Allison then went on to become the president of the former Charles Koch Foundation, what, what is now known as the Cato Institute, which has funded, according to Politico, to the tune of well over $20 million, uh, a small group of right-wing talk show hosts who are now, including um, Laura Ingram and uh, Mark Levin, who are now publicly on Fox News, were all last night and are now today, taking credit for having beaten Eric Cantor, taking down Eric Cantor and and lifted up Dave Bratt. That's one narrative. Another narrative I'm hearing is that the Democrats showed up and voted in this primary and just basically screwed Cantor. A third one I'm hearing is that the Republican base was so energized and so PO'd that Cantor had become part of the establishment, uh, you know, uh, a uh, country club Republican rather than a grassroots Republican, that they showed up and kicked him out, and Bratt just seemed like the the most reasonable next guy. Um, I'm curious your take on it. Well, you know, there are, I could probably, we could come up with ten more narratives here, quite frankly. Um, I think this is a Tea Party victory, you know, and the establishment has had some victories, the Republican establishment here recently. What I see in what happened last night in the surprising loss by Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader, I mean, it's a pretty big scalp for the conservative grassroots, is that the Tea Party must be listened to by Republican leaders. And what I mean by that is, if Eric Cantor is a face of the Republican establishment, and he certainly is, he lost because he did not listen to his constituents within his own party. I mean, you can look at another face of the establishment, like Mitch McConnell, who also had a Tea Party challenger. But what did Mitch McConnell do that Eric Cantor did not do? Well, Mitch McConnell, you know, allied himself with Rand Paul, and he... Aggressively campaigned. That's exactly right. I mean, Eric Cantor spent $150,000 on steak dinners with lobbyists during the period of time that Dave Dave Bratt spent only $120,000 on his on his campaign flyers. That's exactly right. So McConnell and Cantor are both obviously creatures of Washington, but McConnell, being politically savvy, whatever else you might think of him, saw the writing on the wall and said, hey, this Tea Party train has left the station. I better do something different. And he did. Um, you know, I could point to things when, when the president and the Republican leadership were wanting to go in, to war in Syria. And, you know, John Boehner wanted that, and Eric Cantor wanted that. And Mitch McConnell sided with Rand Paul and, and Mike Lee and others um, and his party's hard right. Things like the hemp production in Kentucky, that's not something McConnell would have got behind beforehand. Um, being against Paul Ryan's budget. Uh, Eric Cantor didn't do any of that. Anything that the Tea Party was for, he was on the opposite side with the establishment. You couple that with ignoring your constituents back in Virginia, which we've heard about now. Time and time again, it just seemed like he was part of Washington, D.C., part of that, not with his own party, certainly not with the grassroots, and I think he paid a price for it yesterday. I think it's a lesson for Republicans in, in high positions like him. But he had gone, I mean, you know, the, 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 the far extreme position of the the libertarian Ayn Rand Tea Party movement is basically do away with everything in government except for the army and the courts and the police. And, you know, no need for public schools, no need for Social Security, no need for Medicare, no need for any kind of social safety net programs. Um, uh, privatize the roads, turn them all into toll roads from the end of your driveway on. Some, some billionaire owns it, you have to pay to use it. I mean, this is the, basically, you go back and you look at when... Uh, David Koch ran for vice president on the Libertarian ticket in 1980. These were the things that were part of the platform. This is the this is the worldview of the Libertarian uh, slash Tea Party slash uh, objectivists. That well, these are not things that I mean, and this is the stuff that Dave Brad is teaching in college. These are not the things that will get you elected to public office. I mean, you might maybe you can win a primary. But if Dave Brad is honest, if he starts, I mean, he's literally teaching Ayn Rand. If he, 
goes out and says, and, and in fact, obviously he's not going to, because last night on Fox I saw him ta- thanking God for the victory, and Ayn Rand said, you know, you have to be an atheist to be an objectivist, to be a libertarian. Um, the uh, objectivists uh, accuse religion of being, uh, you know, one of the fundamental evils in society. So, you know, uh, I, I just don't get it. It's like there, there, there's a, some, some sort of cognitive dissonance going on here. Sure, and you know, I must admit, as a libertarian-leaning conservative, I know some pretty radical folks, some of them friends of mine, who believe everything you just said for the most part. But I will say this, when we're talking about political agendas, you know, we can mischaracterize politicians by taking the absolute extremes. Look, conservatives do this with liberals and progressives all the time. They'll find some socialist professor or somebody that said something favorable about communism somewhere and say yeah, that that's Bill Ayers represents all of us. Right, that Barack Obama must be a secret communist or whatever they want to call it, yeah. and that's not necessarily so. But he's, but they're definitely onto something. That there's a general philosophy that you, if you follow it to its logical extreme end, uh, does lead to something like that. Well, the tra- same could be true on the right, particularly the libertarian right. I don't know that Dave Bratt or people like Rand Paul or Justin Amash or Mike Lee or Tom Massey or any of those guys have have tried to run on a pure Ayn Randian objective agenda. Uh, well, George W. Bush ran in 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 seventy nine in Texas for House of Representatives on a platform of privatizing Social Security. And in 2005, when he got reelected, the first thing he did was he said he was going to use the, the political capital that he got from the Iraq war to privatize Social Security. And he tried. He pushed that legislation really hard. He lost. Right. Well, I, we could argue about the, the merits of of privatizing Social Security, I mean, that's Ayn Rand wouldn't believe in Social Security to begin with, so that's that's the big. That's my point. She said it should be privatized, although she took it when she was older, and she took Medicare as well. She certainly did. I, I just don't think it's fair to characterize these actual politicians and their agendas by the the philosophical extreme. That you could also do the same thing to to people in the Democratic Party. I don't think that's accurate. But I'm, my point is that if George Bush ran on this and tried to do it as president, is it really all that extreme? Um, perhaps not. I mean, you know, a lot of young people, and I certainly think that, you know, there could be better solutions to our entitlement system that we have now that are not government-based. And I know for a lot of my friends on the left, that sort of freaks them out in a pretty significant way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I'll, you know, I'll own up to that. Voters as well. I'll own up to that. So uh, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, Paul, uh, excuse me, um, Eric Cantor just, just came out and said that at the end of next month, he's going to resign as House Majority Leader, which means that You know, if you look at the uh, Republicans who showed up for this uh, meeting at the caucus room restaurant, the January 20th, 2009, the night that Obama was being inaugurated, there was, uh, Newt Gingrich has come on this program and told us about this, Uh, there was a meeting of uh, Republicans where they planned the strategy for the next four years, what ultimately became the next eight years, of uh, Pete Sessions later said, who was there at the meeting, later said, and I quote, Taliban insurgency. Uh, insurgency is the way they went about systematically understanding how to disrupt and change a person's entire process. We need to understand that insurgency is going to be required to deal with the other side. And uh, Kevin McCarthy went on to say, we've got to challenge them on every single bill, show united and unyielding opposition to the president's economic policies. So the guys who were at the party at this meeting, this four-hour meeting that night to plan Republican strategy for the next four years, were Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, Kevin McCarthy, Pete Sessions, Jeb Henseling, Pete Hoekstra, and Dan Lundgren, and then there were five Republican senators, um, one of them being Jim DeMent, who's now the head of the Heritage Foundation. Of those guys, I'm guessing whoever replaces Eric Cantor is going to be one of those guys who was in on that super insider meeting. What, what's your take on that? I mean, that's possible. You're hearing a lot about Kevin McCarthy um, and others. I, I'm not going to speculate on that. I don't know. Um, I mean, th- that's possible. I mean, in, in my dream world, Justin Amash would be a House Majority Leader. I would, I uh, you know, I would support you on that. Uh, Justin Amash, uh, you, know, I, I, uh, he, you know, he wants to privatize Social Security, but he also wants to dial down the NSA. And so I can find some common ground with Justin Amash. That's exactly right. And I, uh, what's interesting to me about this, and I, I've seen a couple people report on this. So David, Dave Brad, at the end of the day, despite disagreements, Tom, you might have on obviously on economic issues and entitlements and things like that. Eric Cantor was, you know, a big protector of the NSA and the metadata collection program. Um, you know, the indefinite detention of American citizens. A guy like Dave Brad, who's the Tea Party supposedly extreme far right guy, is actually on the opposite side of those. Do you I know that for a fact? 
Yeah, I mean, if you could go to his website and look on his issues, he says he's for the Fifth Amendment and protects the indefinite detention of American citizens. He's against that, rather not doesn't protect it, right. and is very much against the NSA, NSA metadata collection program. I right. think that's a significant sort of uh, mix-up of you know what's left and right and putting people in those compartmental boxes. I, I think that's significant that a guy like Eric Cantor, who was such a spokesman for the national security state, was taken out by a guy with those those positions. Very interesting. But those positions were never highlighted in the election. I mean, I've got the I've got the the literature here. I've got uh, Dave Bratt's flyer in my hand, and he talks about he's in favor of defunding Obamacare, opposing amnesty, lowering the national debt, opposing insider trading, and ending corporate welfare. And he alleges that Eric Cantor is in favor of all five of those things. And that's it. Those were the only topics. Well, actually, okay, here's on the other side. End government bailouts, repeal Obamacare, balance the federal budget, uh, protect the Second Amendment. The closest he gets is uphold the Constitution and promote individual liberty, I, you know, which is, I think anybody could say that. But he, he, he certainly didn't run on, on getting the NSA under control. No, but it's there, and it is significant somewhat. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I think it's important. That's where the grassroots on the right is. It's very different from the Bush years. Fascinating stuff. You're right. Jack Hunter. Jack, nice talking with you. Rare.us is the website. Thanks, Jack. Great talking with you, Tom. Good talking with you. We'll be back.